Good evening, everyone. I hope you all are doing well. Tonight is Wednesday, June 16th, 2021. We are studying Ezekiel chapters 43, 44, and 45. I'm grateful to God that we're able to sit here together and share the word of God. I watched a video this week about the history of the Bible. The person that was teaching broke down the components of the Bible so clearly that I was amazed as to how much I did not know. The other thing that I realized is that I am so ignorant of so many aspects of the Bible. He said that he had been teaching the 40 for 40 plus years and had visited Israel many, many times. All the facts just rolled out and I could tell that he was a scholar of God's word. Brilliant. As I stated before, I was amazed. One thing I noticed though, was he and I don't agree on everything, but that which he knew, he knew. I don't know how I can sit here and make an attempt to share with you as he did but I'm going to try to continue to try and make sense out of his word. Did you know that the 39 books of the Old Testament was mostly arranged by Ezra? I didn't either. Did you know that the 39 books of the Old Testament consists of three divisions, 17 books of history, five books of wisdom, and 17 books of prophecy. Of the 17 history books and 17 prophecy books also, they are further divided into three sections, five major, nine pre-exile, and three books referred to post-exile. Did you know that of the five wisdom books, the book of Job speaks of godly suffering. Psalms speak of godly worship. Proverbs speaks of practical living. And Ecclesiastes spe speaks of godly life. Song of Solomon speaks of love. This is all so enlightening and I'm loving it. When you can find out the purpose of something, it's much easier to understand what you're looking at as well as what it is you're trying to glean from it. People, we need to study to show ourselves approved of God. We can't help anyone if we don't know what we're talking about. Try explaining something that you know nothing about and see how far you get. The book of Ezekiel is an end time book. From Genesis to Esther, we're talking about history. From Isaiah to Malachi, we're talking about prophecy. Remember, history is documentation that something actually happened, and prophecy is something that is in progress or will happen in the future. Ezekiel and some of the other prophets are mainly having visions for another time. So if you're speculating or listening to anyone else speculate on anything regarding what will happen during the end of the world times, take a good look at what God personally told the prophets and what the prophets said to the people in the Bible. Not what the living prophets of today are saying. Some of them don't even know the actual words that came from God during the Old Testament biblical prophet days. I am just now getting a clear vision of the differences between God's relationship with the church and God's relationship with the Jewish nation. Believe me, there is a difference. God has plans for his people who were chosen under the Abrahamic covenant and for his people who were grafted into the tree under the new covenant. I was in that group and so were the rest of the Gentiles. 
Remember when I spoke with you about the covenants? As a refresher, I will list them. The, no the Noahic covenant, that's the covenant he made with Noah using the rainbow. The Abrahamic covenant and the Mosaic covenant and the Davidic covenant and the new covenant under which we are. Judah and Israel have also been God's chosen people from the beginning, and that status continues. In the book of Ezekiel, these two nations will come together as one under the rulership of the Prince of David. And I'm talking about the house of Judah and the house of Israel. In all of the countries that we see, there are remnants of Judah and Israel spread across the country, spread across the land. God will bring them back together again. There will be a joining of the nations. He will reign with them and his church will meet him at the marriage supper of the Lamb. There will be other various events taking place such as the Battle of Armageddon, the Thousand Year Reign, etc. These things will be happening in the end time. And if we are faithful and righteous, we will be with him. In our chapters tonight, Ezekiel 43, the Spirit of the Lord returns to the new temple. This is the third temple. There are many illustrations of the temple online. Please take some time and Google this for a clearer vision of what these chapters are describing. They are remarkable. I do not know enough technology to show these charts to you tonight, but I am sure if you take a little time to search, you will find out what I'm talking about. Make this wonderful book come alive to you. God has so much he wants you to be aware of. We will go into our Bible study in a minute. I've been receiving YouTube videos from crazy sources. This is propaganda. Please don't get caught up in this mess. They just pop up on my phone, and in the beginning they sounded sensible, but further on into the video, it gets weird. Don't listen to this unrighteous stuff. Read the word for yourself. All I can say is this. Before you make any decisions regarding the troubles of this world, make sure that you compare it with the word of God. He has the last say, and he alone will take back this world for his glory and his honor. There is no one on this earth that can resolve the ills of this world, only God. He has reserved this take back for himself. Read the word. We will now begin our lessons tonight. I pray that we will all get some insight on this wonderful story. In chapter 43, God's glory comes to Ezekiel's temple. The glory of God comes to his temple. The glory of the Lord comes through the eastern gate. Ezekiel's understanding of and reaction to God's glory. God's claim to the temple and to Israel. His purpose for a detailed description of Ezekiel's temple the altar of burnt offerings, the measurements of the altar, the consecration ceremony for the altar. These are all found in chapter 43. The vision of the glory of God filling the temple. Now you know that first Moses had built the tabernacle out in the desert as they were traveling. That was the first semblance of any type of worship space for God's people. There was a holy of holies in there where the priests could only go in. And if they weren't right, they would have to come. Sometimes they would, be, they would die 
and they had were attached to a rope that had to be pulled out from under them. This new temple, the Holy of Holies, the Lord himself will take occupancy there and he will be in that spot and there will be ministers to him to whatever services that he needs. Also, we know about Solomon's temple when he built it in Jerusalem and at that time, the glory of the Lord filled the house. This third temple, I was, let me go back to Solomon's temple. Through the disobedience of the people, the glory left the temple and that was, that was when every, the prophets were telling them, you are living terrible lives you need, you've not diso you're disobeying the Lord and God just left the temple and turned it over to the, to the reprobate. I guess we would call it that. But this new temple that Ezekiel is going to be talking about tonight is the one that will more than likely be a model of the throne of God when he comes back to rule and reign on this earth. We know about the thousand year millennial reign. I cannot tell you all of the details about all of that, but this is a remarkable story. I watched on TV today the meetings of the minds, and this week we, the leaders have been meeting. I just wish they knew that God was in control, okay? In Ezekiel 11.23, the glory went up from the midst of the city, and stood upon the mountain which is on the east side of the city. Remember that. This was in the 11th chapter of Ezekiel when we were talking. He left the midst of the temple. He left the temple and he left from the midst of the city and he stood upon the mountain. When he comes back, he will not come into the city. He will come upon the top of the mountain on the east side of the city. Verse 1, afterward he brought me to the gate, this is Ezekiel talking, even the gate that looketh toward the east. And behold, the glory of God, of the God of Israel, came from the way of the east and his voice was like a noise of many waters, and the earth shined with his glory. So we know he left the temple through the east, and he was on the mountain. In Ezekiel's temple, the glory of the Lord is going to come back through the same direction. Verse 3, according it... And it was according to the appearance of the vision which I saw, even according to the vision that I saw, when I came to destroy the city. And the visions were like the vision that I saw by the river Shabar, and I fell upon my face. This mention, he's mentioning uh, verse 3, is um, a reference to his a rendition of what happened to the vision in Ezekiel 1, chapter 1, chapter 10, and chapter 11. He saw the vision. I want to remind you that when Ezekiel is talking to us, it is not actually happening at that time. He is seeing a vision of a future occurrence, okay? Verse 4, and the glory of the Lord came into the house by way of the gate whose prospect is toward the east. So the Spirit took me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. So Ezekiel is still being um, moved by the Spirit. He is being physically taken to different locations by the unction of the Spirit. It could be translation or he could just be moving according to the way the Spirit is leading him. 
I'm not too sure about that part. Verse 6. And I heard him speaking unto me out of the house. So the Lord had entered the house of the temple. This is a figurative temple, one of his, one of his visions. But the Lord was speaking to him out of the house. It's like we have a dream and all of these things are happening, but they're not really happening. Okay. But he heard him speaking to him out of the house. And um, the man stood by me. That's verse 6, Ezekiel 43. In Ezekiel 40, verses 3 and 4, there was a man with a measuring reed. You remember hearing that story? He walked around measuring things. In Daniel uh, chapter 12, there was a man clothed in linen. In Ezekiel 9 and 10, there was a man that was um, putting mark upon people who was showing grief about the terrible things that was happening when the Jerusalem, uh, the children of Israel were being uh, taken captive to go to Babylon. So this man was measuring people who was displaying uh, symptoms of grief and sorrow because of what was happening. This also was mentioned in Luke 16 uh, through 19, okay? Verse 7. Now, let's, let's remember, the man stood by him. He just come out of nowhere, okay? That was a part of the vision. And he said unto me, Son of man, the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. And my holy name shall the house of Israel no more defile, neither they nor their kings by their whoredom, nor by the carcasses of the kings in their high places. In their setting of their threshold, by my thresholds, and their posts by my posts, and the wall between me and them, they have even defiled my holy name by their abominations that they have committed. Wherefore, I have consumed them in my anger. Now we know that in, in chapters 38, 39, uh, when Gog of Magog and all of the other nations came down to defeat Israel, they came against Israel, how the Lord just beat them at Battle of Armageddon, how he beat them, and they were all dead. It took seven years to bury the dead. They were defeated. The people in the Battle of Armageddon that came down against Israel were defeated and destroyed. So he's saying, I have consumed them in my anger. They're out of the picture now. Now let them put away their whoredom, talking to the children of Israel, and the carcasses of their kings far from me, and I will dwell in the midst of them forever. Forever is eternity. Verse 10, thou son of man, here's what I want you to do. Show the house to the house of Israel, that they may be ashamed of their iniquities, and let them measure the pattern. Now, he is not talking to us, the Gentiles. He is doing this in preparation for the unification of the house of Judah and the house of Israel. And we know by the recent elections over there, there are many people who have joined uh, forces as one collaborative group to run Israel. So there's so many different factions, so many different religions. But in when Jesus comes back, the house of Judah and the house of Israel will unite as one nation under God. Okay? This is very important for us to understand. 
He says in verse 11, and if they be ashamed of all that they have done, he says, show them the form of the house and the fashion thereof. In other words, explain to them what it's going to look like and how it's going to be. And the goings out thereof and the comings in there, thereof. And all the forms thereof and all the ordinances thereof and all the forms thereof. He's still saying it. And all the laws thereof and write it in their sight that they may keep the whole form thereof and all the ordinances thereof and do them. This is the law of the house. Upon the top of the mountain, the whole limit thereof round about shall be most holy. Behold, this is the law of the house. So in the law of the house, you're going to be told about the form, the fashion, the goings out, the comings in, all the ordinances, all the laws, and you're to keep the house and you're to do the ordinances, okay? The altar of sacrifice is spoken of starting at verse 13. And these are the measures of the altar after the cubits. The cubit is a cubit and an hand breadth. Even the bottom shall be a cubit and the breadth a cubit. And the border thereof by the edge thereof round about shall be a span. And this shall be the higher place of the altar. So now a cubit is the length of a forearm, which it says is 18 inches. A hand span is um, the tip of your thumb to the tip of your little finger. If you would go online to look at the third temple de demonstration, you will see what I'm talking about. That he's, ex he's giving Ezekiel the actual measurements and dimensions of how the new kingdom where he is going to sit on the throne is going to be built and what it's going, the measurements of it. Verse 14, and from the bottom upon the ground, even to the lower settle shall be two cubits. So that's 36 inches. And the breadth one cubit. And from the lesser settle, even unto the greater settle, shall be four cubits and the breadth one cubit. So the altar shall be four cubits, and from the altar and upward shall be four horns. I don't know how long a horn is, okay? And the altar shall be twelve cubits long, twelve broad, square in the four squares thereof. And the settle shall be fourteen cubits long, and fourteen broad in the four squares thereof. And the border about it shall be a half a cubit, and the bottom thereof shall be a cubit about, and his stairs shall look toward the east. So the stairs in there shall look toward the east. In verses 18 to 22, to 22 he's talking about the offerings. There's a lot of offerings that they gave back in the day. And this is a refresher to remind them of when they performed these during a time when they weren't living right. But when the new throne is built, I'm going to have these offerings and you are expected to observe them as a reminder of what it is you were supposed to do then, but were not able to because you were not clean. Verse 18, and he said unto me, son of man, thus saith the Lord God, these are the ordinances of the altar in the day when they shall make it to offer burnt offerings thereon and to sprinkle blood thereon. And thou shalt give to the priests, the Levites that be of the seed of Zadok, which approach unto me to minister unto me, saith the Lord God a young bullock for a sin offering. 20, and thou shalt take of the blood thereof and put it in on the four horns of it 
and on the four corners of the settle and upon the border around about. Thus shalt thou cleanse and purge it. You remember when the children of Israel spread the blood over the doorpost so that death would pass over the children during that time? This is also reminding. Thou shalt take the bullock also of the sin offering, and he shall burn it in an appointed place of the house without the sanctuary. Uh, that's on the outside of the sanctuary, I believe. And on the second day thou shalt offer a kid of the goats without blemish for a sin offering, and they shall cleanse the altar. And they did cleanse it with the bullock. So you got a burnt offering and you got sin offering that he's talking about here. 23. And when thou hast made an end of cleansing it, thou shalt offer a young bullock without blemish and a ram out of the flock without blemish. And thou shalt offer them before the Lord and the priest shall cast salt upon them and they shall offer them up for a burnt offering unto the Lord. Seven days shalt thou prepare every day a goat for a sin offering. They shall also prepare a young bullock and a ram out of the flock without blemish. Seven days shall thou they purge the altar and purify it, and they shall consecrate themselves. And when these days are expired, it shall be that upon the eighth day and so forward, the priest shall make your burnt offerings upon the altar and your peace offerings, and I will accept you, saith the Lord God. The results of these offerings, they can take the food, and we're going to talk about that a little later on. In chapter 44, it discusses the east gate and the prince, and the prince being the Lord. The shut of the east gate. The privilege of the prince, those admitted to the temple who will be admitted, marking who may enter the house of the Lord, and there will be those that are excluded from the temple. The laws of the priests, the Levites who were far from God, they have a, a, a proclamation. The priests and their ministry to the Lord, the clothing of the priests, the outward displays of holiness for the priests, the teaching and leading work of the priests, the defilement of the priests, and the inheritance and provision for the priests. These are items that we will be talking about in chapter 44. Verse 1. Then he brought me back the way of the gate of the outward sanctuary, which looketh toward the east, and it was shut. Now, this is what I want you to listen to. The sanctuary gate that looked toward the east was shut. Why was it shut, Sister Carol? Then said the Lord unto me, This gate shall be shut. It shall not be opened, and no man shall enter in by it. Why? Because the Lord, the God of Israel, hath entered in by it. Therefore, it shall be shut. Verse 3, it is for the prince. The prince, he shall sit in it to eat bread before the Lord. He shall enter by, way, by the way of the porch of that gate and shall go out by way of the same. Some people have said that the prince is uh, the David that was once the king of Israel, that he's going to be brought back to reign and rule. So I can understand if it says the prince shall sit in it to eat before the Lord. Okay, so those are things that we need to take heed and, and think about. Verse 4, then brought he me the way of the north gate before the house, and I looked, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord, and I fell upon my face. 
And the Lord said unto me, Son of man, mark well, and behold with thine eyes, and hear with thine ears all that I say unto thee concerning all the ordinances of the house of the Lord, and all the laws thereof, and mark well the entering in of the house, and with every going forth of the sanctuary. And thou shalt say to the rebellious, even to the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, O ye house of Israel, let it suffice you all, you of all your abominations. In that ye have brought into my sanctuary strangers, uncircumcised in heart and uncircumcised in flesh, to be in my sanctuary, to pollute it, even my house, when ye offer my bread, the fat and the blood, and they have broken my covenant because of all your abominations. And ye have not kept the charge of mine holy things, but ye have set keepers of my charge in my sanctuary for yourselves. These are to the, the rebellious that was called themselves taking care of his, his sanctuary. Thus saith the Lord, no stranger, uncircumcised in heart, nor uncircumcised in flesh shall enter into my sanctuary of any stranger that is among the children of Israel. So whoever you, you bring among you, they will not come into my sanctuary. Verse 10, And the Levites that are gone away from me when Israel went astray, which went astray away from me after their idols, they shall even bear their iniquity. Yet they shall be ministers in my sanctuary having charge at the gates of the house and ministering to the house, they shall slay the burnt offering and the sacrifice for the people. And they shall stand before them to minister unto them. Because they ministered unto them before their idols and caused the house of Israel to fall into iniquity, therefore have I lifted up my hand against them, saith the Lord God, and they shall bear their iniquity. And they shall not come near me to do the office of a priest unto me, nor to come near any of my holy things in the most holy place, but they shall bear their shame and their abominations which they have committed. But I will make them keepers of the charge of the house for all the services thereof, and for all that shall be done therein. In other words, they, those people who cudgeled the sinners back in the day that went away and haphazardly took care of the temple and didn't adhere to all the rules and the regulations, I don't want you near me. I don't want you to bring any food. I don't want you to do any service for me whatsoever. Your job will be to be keepers of the charge of the house for all the services that need to be done in the house and for all that shall be done therein. Now 15, he says, I'm talking to a different group of people here. Ezekiel, but the priest, the Levites, the son of Zadok that kept the charge of my sanctuary when the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near to me to minister unto me. And they shall stand before me to offer unto me the fat and the blood, saith the Lord God. 16. They shall enter into my sanctuary, and they shall come near to my table to minister unto me. And they shall keep my charge. Do you remember the altar and the, the shoe bread and everything that was in the temple uh, that they had situated out there? The Lord is saying they can bring things there for me. Okay? Verse 17. And it shall come to pass that when they enter in at the gates of the inner court, they shall be clothed with linen garments. Did I not tell you there was a man measuring the reed? They were in linen clothes at, at early on in 43. There's something special about wearing linen. A lot of people today don't like to wear linen because it wrinkles easily. But that is the material that the Lord will require of his 
workers or his uh, priests. Let me put it that way. Now listen to this. I'm going to read 17 again. And it shall come to pass that when they enter in at the gates of the inner court, they should be clothed with linen garments. And no wool shall come upon them. Whilst they minister in the gates of the inner court and within. So when you're inside of the court, you see there's a big plot of land on top of the mountain that's been walled off. And anything within the wall, there are, I call them dormitories, but there's sections of houses that scattered around the edges of the wall of the city of God. And the priests and have a uh, charge over them. There is a place where they will cook the food or make the sacrifices. There is a place where they will serve the people to eat. It's amazing. Look it up online, the third temple, okay? And then it says here, They shall have linen bonnets upon their heads and shall have linen breeches upon their loins. So their pants will be linen. And they shall not gird themselves with anything that causeth sweat. So they need some type of material, which is linen, I'm assuming, that will, the air can flow through. And as you're working, we're going to be in bodies that will sweat. I didn't, I don't understand it, but that's okay with me. And when they go forth into the utter court so there's another place even unto the utter court to the people that everybody's not going to be permitted inside but they're going to be on the outside they shall put off their garments wherein they ministered and lay them in the holy chambers and they shall put on garments and they shall not sanctify the people with their garments so the garments that you're using to to serve me, you change them. You put, lay them in the holy chambers and you go and put something else on and then you go out and minister to the people, okay? It says, neither shall they shave their heads nor suffer their locks to grow long. They shall only pull their heads. I don't understand what pull mean, but maybe it means just cut your hair a little short. Neither shall any priest drink wine when they enter into the inner court. So there's a question mark there also. Neither shall they take for their wives a widow, nor her that is put away. But they shall take maidens of the seed of the house of Israel, or a widow that had a priest before. I'm not understanding that, and I'm not going to claim to you that I understand it. But God knows what he's talking about, and this is what's going to happen. 23, and they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and profane, and cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. And in controversy, they shall stand in judgment, if there's an argument or something, and they shall judge it according to my judgments. So, and they shall keep my laws and my statutes and all my assemblies, and they shall hollow my Sabbaths. I'm, I'm kind of thinking this is maybe during the thousand year thing, reign, where there are going to be people out there that are not circumcised, but they're going to have to be priests that will go out and minister to them. During that millennial reign, people still have a chance to make it to heaven. So it looks like during that time, life will be the same. We'll have cities, we'll have princes over these provinces, and there'll be regular living. Everybody will have husbands and wives or whatever the case may be, and that's the way uh, it will be. But I'm not sure, and I'm not making no proclamations right now, okay? And they shall come in, and they shall come at no dead person to defile themselves. But for father, or for mother, or for son, or for daughter, 
for brother or for sister that have had no husband, they may defile themselves. I'm not understanding some of this. And after he is cleansed, they shall reckon unto him seven days. And in the day that he goeth into the sanctuary, unto the inner court to minister in the sanctuary, he shall offer his sin offering, saith the Lord God. 28. And it shall be unto them for an inheritance. I am their inheritance. Don't look for nothing special other than me. And ye shall give them no possession in Israel. I am their possession. They shall eat the meat offering and the sin offering and the trespass offering. And every dedicated thing in Israel shall be theirs. And the first of all, the first fruits of all things. And every oblation of all. Oblation is something presented or offered to God. For every sort of oblations shall be the priests. Ye shall also give unto the priests the first of your dough, that he may cause the blessing to rest in thy house, thine house. The priests shall not eat of anything that is dead of itself or torn, whether it be fowl or beast. I do understand that. Okay? But but think about think about these things that we're saying now in the verse 30 it says in the first fruit first of all the first fruits of all things I'm I'm hearing and as I do my research Israel right now is the most fruitful have the most fruitful agricultural system in the world they are um distributing and selling goods to different nations in the country because their ground and their land is so fertile. And some of the other people are even seeking uh, instructions from them as to how their land got so good. If they tell me that Israel looked like a barren land in times past and the ground was hard and crusty and some of the places are still that way in Israel today. And the reason why is because some of the rulers in the other countries that owned them at the time, they taxed them with according to the number of trees that they had on their property. And because of the taxation rules of how many trees you have on the property, that's how much tax we're going to charge you, the people started cutting the trees down. And that's when... Israel started looking like a barren land. It still has not recuperated from the lack of the, the trees and stuff that it once had early on. It was like a Garden of Eden, but it was destroyed because people didn't want to pay tax on the number of trees that they had on their property. And that's the end of chapter 44. Regarding the priests of Ezekiel's temple, there was land for the priests, the portion for the Levites, a portion for the house of Israel, and a portion for the prince, the offerings of the temple priests. There was a call for justice and fairness, the offering of the prince, atonement for sins done in ignorance, and there was a Passover offering. The Lord's portion of the land. I told you before, he owned it all, right? That's what he told the people. Verse 1, Moreover, when ye shall divide by lot the land for inheritance, ye shall offer an oblation unto the Lord. That's an offering. And holy portion of the land. The length shall be the length of five and twenty thousand reeds. And the breadth shall be ten thousand. This shall be holy in all the borders thereof round about. So he's giving for the people that own the land outside of the city of God. That's what he's, give, he's giving them rules. Of this there shall be for the sanctuary 500 in length and 500 in breadth, square round about and 50 cubits round about for the suburbs thereof. 
there will be suburbs there as well. So what I'm looking at here when I think about the lot for the inheritance in the land, God is letting us know, he said about 25 and 20,000 reeds. Reeds were those things that they used to grow out and uh, some people use them for fishing poles and, and other types of things. But a long reed, sometimes they would grow tall and, and he, you would measure uh, the portion of your land by the longest reed that you had in your, um, on your land. Of this, verse 2, there shall be, shall be for the sanctuary 500 in length, 500 in breadth. I read this before. Square round about and 50 cubits round about for the suburbs. Verse 3, and of this measure shall thou measure the length of five and twenty thousand and the breadth of ten thousand, and in it shall be the sanctuary and the most holy place. The holy portion of the Lord shall be for the priests, the ministers of the sanctuary, which shall come near to minister unto the Lord, and it shall be a place for their houses and a holy place for the sanctuary. So within the, the, the beautiful city, there will be houses for the priests who are ministering unto the Lord. And the five and twenty thousand in, of length and the ten thousand of breadth shall also the Levites, the ministers of the house, have for themselves for a possession for twenty chambers. So the Levites' houses, there will be 20 chambers built within the city. And ye shall appoint the possession of the city 5,000 broad and 5 and 20,000 long. Over against the oblation of the holy portion, it shall be for the whole house of Israel. This section talks about a portion for the print, for the prince. And a portion shall be for the prince on the one side and on the other side of the oblation of the holy portion and of the possession of the city. Before the oblation of the holy portion and before the possession of the city from the west side westward and from the east side eastward and the length shall be over against one of the portions from the west border unto the east border. I know that you don't understand what I'm saying tonight, and I don't either. But I do know that he has measured out this city. He is precise in his measurements, and it will be expected to be completed according to this engineering report. In the land, verse 8, shall be his possession in Israel, and my princes shall no more oppress my people, and the rest of the land shall they gather to the house of Israel according to their tribes. Verse 9, thus saith the Lord God, let it suffice you, O princes of Israel, remove violence and spoil, and execute judgment and justice. Take away your exactions from my people, saith the Lord God. Ye shall have just balances and a just ephah and a just bath. The ephah and the bath shall be of one measure and that the bath may contain the tenth part of an homer and the ephah the tenth part of a homer. The measurement thereof shall be after the homer and the shekel shall be 20 geras, 20 shekels, Five and twenty shekels, fifteen shekels shall be your manith. So I guess that's going to be your salary. I don't know, but we're going to have to find out some more information about that. All right. Thirteen. This is the oblation, the offering that ye shall offer. The sixth part of an ephah of a homer of wheat. And ye shall give the sixth part of an ephah of a homer of barley. Concerning the ordinance of oil, this is to the Levites, I'm pretty sure the priests, because they don't have a, a land that they can get things from. Concerning the ordinance of oil, the bath of oil, ye should offer the tenth part of a bath out of the core 
which is a homer of 10 baths, for 10 baths are an homer. So that's how much it's equal to. This is, this is monetary we're talking about. And one lamb out of the flock, out of 200, out of the fat pastures of Israel for a meat offering and for a burnt offering and for peace offerings to make reconciliation for them, saith the Lord God. All the people of the land shall give this oblation for the prince in Israel. And it shall be the prince's part to give burnt offerings and meat offerings and drink offerings in the feast in the new moons and in the Sabbaths, in the solemnities of the house of Israel, which shall prepare the sin offering and the meat offering and the burnt offering and the peace offerings to make reconciliation for the house of Israel. Israel has a lot of reconciliation to do. Verse 18, you will find this information also in Ezekiel 12, uh, I mean Exodus 12 verses 1 through 20, and Leviticus 23, verses 33 to 43. Thus saith the Lord God in the first month, in the first day of the month, thou shalt take away, take a young bullock without blemish and cleanse the sanctuary. And the priest shall take of the blood of the sin offering and put it upon the posts of the house and upon the four corners of the settle of the altar and upon the post of the gate of the inner court. And so... Thou shalt do the seventh day of the month for every one that erreth, and for him that is simple, so shall ye reconcile the house. Verse 20 is important. People do error in ignorance. They don't know that they have done wrong or done something. And there are simple people that may have done something wrong. So he's saying this, do this the seventh day of the month for those people who have erred and for those who are simple so that you can reconcile the house. There are things that, that you do have to ask forgiveness for and I would consider or suggest that we reconcile our house every night before we go to bed, everything that we've done uh, knowingly and unknowingly, we need to pray for that. Pray about it and ask for forgiveness. 21, in the first month, in the 14th day of the month, ye shall have the Passover. A feast of seven days unleavened bread shall be eaten. There's a story behind the unleavened bread. I can't tell it all to you tonight, but I will try my best to give it to you next week because it is great. These, these feasts, there were about seven of them. I have a paper here that, that itemizes them, the sin offering, the peace offerings, and stuff like that. There's a reason why the Jewish people um, um, perform these offering rituals today. And most of them represent the coming of the Lord. They're looking for the king, okay? It says here, on 23 and seven days of the feast, he shall prepare a burnt offering to the Lord, seven bullocks and seven rams without blemish daily the seven days, and a kid of the goats daily for a sin offering. And he shall prepare a meat offering of an ephah for a bullock and an ephah for a ram and a hen of oil for an ephah. We're going to find out what the, the Ephas are next week, all right? Um, 25, in the seventh month, in the 15th day of the month, shall he do the like in the feast of the seven days, according to the sin offering, according to the burnt offering, according to the meat offering, and according to the oil. That is the end of chapter 45. Next week, the Lord willing, we will continue Bible study in the book of Ezekiel, beginning with chapter 46. I give thanks to the Lord for providing us with vaccinations to safeguard us from the spread of COVID. I give thanks to the Lord for the relief that he has given to us in this world's pandemic situation. 
I pray for safety precautions as we prepare for our return to our church services. I pray for all the families who have lost their loved ones through COVID-19, through sickness and gun violence on our streets. I pray for the power of God to bless our overseer and all of our members as we attend the 2021 Church of God of Prophecy Pennsylvania State Convention next month. I pray for people all over this world to know God through his Holy Spirit as they receive his great salvation. I pray for God to touch, bless, and lead and guide our leaders in America. Please, God, heal our land and heal our sorrow. I thank God for his grace and his mercy. To those of you who stayed with me tonight, and I know it was hard, I thank you very much. I hope to see you next week. God bless you all. Good night, everyone. God be with you.